Welcome to the podcast, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Good to Absolute be here. Absolute pleasure. How are you feeling after the run? Uh, good, actually. <laughs> yeah. I was a bit, when we started and you were like, should we do 15k? I'm like, okay, um, why not? It was a bit reluctant, but... Bit of a Sunday edition now, isn't it? Yeah, get into it. 10k, 15k. What's next? Half marathon? Half marathon next week, marathon soon. 10 in the morning. How are you feeling this morning, first thing? Um, to be fair, actually, so in, in complete honesty, um, you know, out last night with friends, probably didn't fuel properly, you know, but woke up, <clears throat> didn't eat anything, didn't have really have anything to drink, came straight here, started the run, but it's just a mental battle. And, you know, as soon as you get a few kilometers in, you're fine. Yeah. Well, three, three K in, we were saying three, four K. Yeah. Three, four K. So three, 4K. for me, it was when we got to, so last week we ran 10 K. Yeah. That, with two 5K splits though. It wasn't yeah. the full, yeah. So that, that 5K point we got to last week, when we got there this week, I thought, actually, I feel 10 times fresher yeah, this yeah. week, which then spurred me on. And, and your legs felt okay? Yeah. Yeah. Calves yeah. weren't so bad? Uh, no, not until like the final couple of kilometers. Your calves started to go at yeah. that point, really? Yeah. 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 Feeling well, I mean, out. It's, it's going to be a bit of a decision now, isn't it? Yeah. Work up to a full marathon at some point. It's just funny seeing how people turn up on a Sunday. I'm always like nine hours of sleep, fresh face and everything like that in my yeah. running gear. And you guys turn up on your bike or like jog over. Half half awake still, maybe three hours in of sleep. Some half people. awake. I'll be <laughs> honest. Like last night, you know, committed a crime with a bit of tequila and. But like I say, if you can't do the time, don't can be worse than crime. Jack though. Three hours sleep. Yeah. Crawling out of bed. Never done a run in the past year or something like that. I most know. likely, we still managed it. You yeah. guys did okay. What, what was the time? Fifteen k. One. Oh, I, it was like an hour thirty or something. It was a slow yeah. pace, but it was comfortable. Average kilometer would be what, like four six k. Yeah. Six minute k. Yeah. That's not too bad. It's okay. Yeah, could have gone yeah. for a half. Yeah. Oh yeah, I had more in me. Yeah, of course. Cool. We'll do it next week. We'll do it next yeah. week. So for the audience, explain what exactly it is that you do first and foremost. So I'm in the property game. Okay. So I come from a family of estate agents and I've sort of been immersed in property my whole life and mm. got to the point when I was maybe 16, 17, last couple of years of school, sort of felt like I was being funneled into the university route by all my teachers, all my friends were going and... I just sort of took a moment and realized, you know, at that point, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, I was very entrepreneurial, mm. had big goals, big dreams, very interested in business and just realized I did not want to spend another few years at university to then get out into the real world. I wanted to get out straight away. So started learning about property investing, making money from property, got into that um, and scaled that up. And, and now, yeah, so I've got a property development company right now, yeah. um, property investments as well. So we do buy property and then um, an education side of the business as well. So, um, the info product space, if you want to call it that high ticket coaching, yeah. teaching different aspects of, um, you know, being successful in property. Yeah. Which of course we're both very familiar with in terms yes. of the info product space. Yeah. So was that being your primary focus over the past two, three years, or is it more so the property investment, which has taken focus? Um, so the, yeah. So in the last two years, it's sort of a transition in my focus from, you know, when I first started out, what I started doing was, you know, the first deal I ever did was, buying a house, refurbing it, selling for profit. But that was buying it for like 10% deposit, which was all yeah. the cash I had, refurbing it on like credit cards and yeah, trying yeah. to get investment from elsewhere. And, and all and at just, eight, 18, right? Yeah, at 18 at the time and just trying to be as resourceful as possible. Did that, did another one, did another one, made you know, a significant amount of money doing that mm. and then got to the point where doing that repetitively wasn't as exciting and made the decision to sort of then move into the more property development stuff. So... Um, now our focus is acquiring land, building houses, but that's a long-term play. It's not yeah. like you flip a house, you can have it turned around in three, four, five months. Yeah, yeah. It's, these are going to be two or three year projects. And so with that, as I made that tra transition in, in my focus towards that, I also, um, at the time, the opportunity sort of presented itself for, or there was a, an apparent demand for people wanting to for, to learn from me, learn what we're doing. So mm. moved into the info product space and, and that's a great cash flow business. And yeah, of part of the premise of what I teach in creating financial freedom, um, which is a term I don't really like, but creating freedom, creating wealth, yeah. income from property, whatever, yeah. is always start by you know building cash flow. Cash flow allows you to you know have more freedom, replace your income, do what you want, but also in a business point of view to to build teams and build systems. And you can't do that without cash flow. And then you know, as well as having cash flow, you want those longer term plays as well. So yeah, absolutely. for me, the education side of the business is the cash flow business, mm. which then is allowing us to be really aggressive with building the teams in the property development company, 
having the right systems, having the best softwares, having the best offices in place. Yeah, and um, meeting the best people. And well, meeting the best investing. people. Yeah, yeah and, and having, you know, having that lifestyle where we've got the freedom to, to go and meet cool people, go mm. to travel to places when, whenever we want. And Yeah, um, particularly is, network you've accumulated here as well. Yeah, and so, so we're in London, the, the networking here and the people we meet is just such... Um, networking is one of those just intangible things which is that huge value added to it when the, the connections I've made down here have just added so much value to my business. Which isn't really prioritised enough, I don't think, particularly coming from an info product background, in my personal opinion. Um, no. Having kind of followed the whole spectrum aspect of Sam Ovens. Um, yeah, so you look at some of the people in the info product space that are up there at the top that a lot of people look up to and it's they're very introverted. Very. Very, yeah, and... You know, don't like, like to really connect with other people. It's like a distraction. Yeah. They'll, they'll be working at a desk for what, 10, 12 hours per day, probably, yeah. most likely, and fail to interact with other people that could probably facilitate growth in other manners. Yeah, and, and it's not so much, you know, you're going to meet someone that's going to give you that hidden key that's going to help you unlock massive scale in the business, but it's just surrounding yourself with people that are just on that same wave, wavelength that inspire you, motivate you, that mm. are way ahead of you that you can learn from and just that inspires you so much more but my sort of approach to networking isn't that I'm gonna meet cool people that are then gonna help me grow my business yeah. it's actually you know if I focus on my business first mm. and build something impressive and from that I'm then gonna attract cool people and then from that that will help even further so I focus on building something cool first which attracts cool people rather than trying to find people to then think that's gonna help grow my business because yeah. at the end of the day 95%, 99% of what's going to grow my business is down to me. But, yeah. you know, you meet two or three cool people a year, that's going to help massively. Yeah, absolutely. So let's break it down into more like black and white terms. And so mm -hmm. in terms of the info products, how many yep. are you involved in right now? So there are two core products that I'm involved in. So one is through my personal brand, which is more of a mass market product that helps people. Essentially how it came about was 18 months, two years ago, when I was getting inundated with people saying, can you mentor me? Can you teach me? Yeah. And I had no intention of teaching or mentoring, but there was an apparent demand there. And I've been through the, the from courses. Your socials. Yeah, from, yeah, from socials, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Yeah. And I, I've been through all the courses in the property space mm. when I was 16, 17, 18. And the standards in property education are very, very low. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to mention any names, um, probably don't need to. And it was very hard for me to recommend to a lot of people, oh, go do this course, go do this course, or I recommend this mentor. Mm. Don't get me wrong, there are a few people I learned from that, that helped me along the way, but I decided, you know what? I want to build something I wish I had when I was 16, 17, 18, that had everything you needed to learn all in one place, yeah. articulated clearly, explained to someone that maybe knows very little about property. Yeah. Because once you go to one of these, if you go to one of these property courses, you know nothing, you know, these terms like mortgages and how mortgages work start getting thrown around so casually and you become yeah, so overwhelmed. Quite foreign. Yeah. I remember the first property course I went to, I was asking the guy next to me, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I built about 18 months ago what I wish I had when I was, you know, starting out, um, begin to sell that, scaled that up, came across people like Sam Ovens mm. and learned how to really not only build a quality product, but then to market it effectively so I can impact as many people as possible. Yeah. That's been in the process of rebuilding now, relaunching that soon. So that's one info product ticked off. That's one info product. Yeah. And then the other product is through, is with my business partner, Rosie. Yeah. And so for anyone that knows Rosie, she's very heavily involved in the property development space and has been for many years. Ro Rosie Cassidy. Rosie Cassidy. Yeah. It's her family business. And she sort of saw what I was doing with the info product that I was doing at the time. And she sort of approached me and said, look, I am very lucky that I've, she's been immersed in it for her whole life the level of knowledge the girl has is it's insane yeah it's insane ridiculous. we yeah. have people on our program that have been involved in property development for 30 35 years mm. and they are just still blown away at the level of knowledge that rosie has as a 23 year old yeah and so yeah so she approached me said i want to sort of give back really and and help share what i've learned from her family yeah and also, again, as a cash flow business. Yeah, of you know, course, so to invest into real estate long term. To invest into real estate, to help grow the business, to help her maybe step away so much from the day-to-day -day operations of being involved in the family business, being a little bit more independent. And now it allows us to focus on our property development company, which me and Rosie are a part of now. So yeah, that's the two programs we have. Both are sort of high ticket. One's um, 5K price point. One's going to be two... Uh, two to three K price point. When that's relaunched. So that's your when, own personal. Yeah. When that's relaunched. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's what I'm involved in. But 
I'm not trying to go down the route of having too many upsells, too many masterminds, because that's one thing that the property education space has. It's you go on one program, you try and get up someone into another program. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people don't like, you know, that sort of space and, and sort of leave it with a sour taste in the mouth. Drives and, negative tension towards it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and my mission, what I'm very passionate about doing is raising the standards in the property education space. That's my, my North Star for that business is yeah. everything we do, you know, the product we build, the service delivery, the marketing is all about, right, let's raise the standards in this space. So and you can do that with two core products alone rather we, than multiple upsells. We just need two just core products which teach two things yeah. and and that's it. And the case studies and success stories we've had from those programs have been amazing. We couldn't have asked for, for, for better success. So those are your two info products. What yep. other businesses are you working on in terms of real estate? Yeah, so like I alluded to earlier, we've now got a property development company. So me and my business partner, Rosie Cassidy, she's somewhat stepped away from her family business now, which she's been involved in for many years. Um, so me and her have got a little bit, um, so she wanted that independence. And so we've been working on for the best part of this year, you know, building a team, putting together the right teams to then acquire land all up and down the country. Yeah, And really where we want to go with the property development side of things is we want to build a prominent brand in that space. You ask anyone in the general public, or maybe people listening, you know, I say, we name, talk about us all the time. Yeah. You and I all the time. Yeah. Name, name some property developers in the UK. And people mention some of the big house builders like Barrett's or Bovis or Taylor Wimpy's, David Wilson, whatever. But yeah. they're, if, if I say, what do those brands mean? If, if I say, what does, what does a brand Rolls Royce mean to you? You think. Epitome of class class excellent high quality yeah, the absolutely. best of the best yeah. or even you know other brands like mercedes or even in other rolex. industries yeah, rolex yeah. you know it's got a certain sort of emotion or messaging attached to it mm. the property development space is very dry and very even on a lower level you know below those bigger house builders i'm sure maybe some people listening to this they may have a family friend or know someone that's a property developer they're generally older people mm. and they're not so much business savvy. A lot of them are people that have owned construction companies that have then fallen into developments and done their own projects. Mm. But there's no brand out there that's really well renowned for, you know, maybe not so much best of the best quality, but a good quality product where if this developer starts building their town, it's like, okay, we want to buy one of them homes. Yeah. And you know, they're oversubscribed and we want to be in the waiting list and it's an experience. And mm. the develop the the company the industry lacks so much innovation. And one example I give is if you go and buy a 300 pound, 300,000 pound Ferrari, yeah. brand new from the dealership, that buying experience will be impeccable. They'll yeah. fly you out to the factory in Italy. Yeah. You get to see your car being built. You'll have a dedicated person at the dealer who's constantly updating you. You'll be able to spec it yeah. as customers you like. And it'll just be the most amazing, you know, two or three month buying experience ever. Mm. And that's for a car that you probably only drive three or four times a month. Yeah. Probably only own it for two years. And then... And it depreciates. And it will depreciate. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas you go buy a £300,000 house from a property developer. Yeah. It's probably going to be shoddy quality. It will need a load of snagging done and you need to build us back in in six months time. Yeah. It'll be a stressful buying experience. Yeah, of course. The way you can spec the home probably won't be that amazing. Mm. And so again, goes back to what I'm trying to do with the education space, really raise the standards. Yeah. Um, I think there's also a lack of education in the real estate space in general. Also yeah. in terms of nuances involved in being either investing in a process, whether it be obviously commercial property or obviously property yeah. living itself. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lack, as, as I said, there's a lack of face in that respect. And yeah. as a result of that, young people don't know what to do in that respect yeah. if they generate money and obviously sure. can invest in a business like that. Yeah, for Particularly, sure. obviously, people we, we're aware of as well. Yes. So, I mean, obviously, in, in terms of context, the people that we're surrounded with here in London, they're very successful individuals doing, mm -hmm. I mean, 160K days revenue-wise for their businesses yeah. at a very young age. But they wouldn't know what to do with real estate in terms of investing, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's, it's one of those industries where a lot of people, you ask... And that's one of the great things about the education space is I don't need to convince people that property is a good business model. Everyone yeah. knows you make money from property. Yeah. Even if you blindly invest, eventually you're going to make money from it. Yeah, it's a but safe it's, bet. Yeah. A lot of people don't really know how to get involved or what mm. to do. So. All the steps involved in that process. Yeah. Who to work with either. Exactly. Because again, there's not a standout. So if we break down the financials on in terms of revenue seems right now mm -hmm. for, you, for yourself, if you don't mind doing so. Yeah, sure. So obviously two info products, what we're doing in terms of numbers there. Month month. Um, so at the minute, one of the high ticket programs, the, um, development program, which is the more expensive high ticket educational program mm. that does anywhere from right now, revenue numbers 
um, some months just under 100k revenue, you know, up to 150k a month revenue. Yeah. Um, and obviously, with, the margins are very lean. The margins are very lean. So there's no yeah. because it's an info product. The service delivery is all online based. It's a very scalable. Yeah. Method of service delivery. There's no cost of goods. Three team members, commission based sales. Yeah, sales yeah. members, and then it's just the cost of the the ads. Yeah, which, which is what like 10, 15k a month. Um, probably more now. Probably like. 20, 25k a month we spend on ads, sometimes more, sometimes less. Yeah. Um, you know, we we trying to make a lot out of organic as well. So yeah. Um, that's one cash flow I've got, income stream coming, I've got coming in. And then the other program I've been doing, you know, that's at its peak was doing 30, 40 40k a month. But obviously I've paused that now, rebuilding it. I've had hundreds of people go through the first version of that program. Again, the success stories, the testimonials, the case studies are amazing. Mm. But I know, you know, there's, I'm, I have someone for high standards. I can go through that program now and I think, okay, now I can improve that. I can improve that, which if I'm going to be putting something out there that I really want to scale, I want to make sure it's the best possible standard, which is why I'm rebuilding it. And again, knowing what I know now from what I've learned, yeah, we could really scale that up. But yeah, of course. They're the two main um, income streams I've got. Obviously, I've got properties, I've got, money that I've made from property in the past. And yeah. so I'm not too dependent on the month to month cash flow. Yeah. And now with the property development projects we've got going on, they're a longer term game, but we'll have the the income from those coming in soon as well. Yeah. The reason why I asked that question primarily speaking is for context in terms of your yeah. lifestyle as well. Okay. So for example, people may see the Lamborghini and obviously the nice apartment and yeah. then wonder as to how you've acquired that in the first place, particularly a younger audience. Yeah. You know, having spoken to 18 year olds thinking like, how the hell, how on earth is Tyler making that much money? Or how is he generating enough money to have that lifestyle and live an abundant lifestyle? So Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to have that blueprint kind of laid out quite clearly. And obviously you're at a point at 18 where you did it all yourself in terms of A to B. And I mean, there's that tweet that we refer to as well. We talked about that Mm -hmm. multiple times where, how how old were you then? 14, 16? Um, I think it was six years ago. So I was maybe, I think I put that tweet out when I was 16, 17, but it was a goal I set even a couple of years before that. Yes, the tweet is. What was the actual tweet? What was it worth? So I I don't use Twitter, never really have. Yeah. And um, to sort of pre-frame the story. You don't want to be a philosopher? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Twitter's full of philosophers. Um, Everyone's a philosopher on Twitter. Yeah. To pre-frame the story, I I was always kind of, and I'm sure we'll go into sort of my mindset as when I was younger. No, I always wanted to achieve great things, whatever. But yeah. I was never really into my cars too much. Like I liked cars, you know, I I see a nice car go past. Yeah. yeah. Really, for me, I could say it's a Ferrari. I wouldn't be able to tell what kind of Ferrari it is. I'd say it's a Lamborghini. I didn't know what kind of Lamborghini it was. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was in um, ICT in computers at school when I was in maybe year nine, year 10. Okay. So maybe like 15 years old. Back in the day. And one of the projects, I think, I can't remember what the project was, but I had to create a presentation on something. For, yeah. I chose cars. And yeah. I was on YouTube and I came across the clip of Richard Hammond on Top Gear driving the what was new at the time the new Lamborghini Aventador right I think it's like a seven or eight minute clip and it was I watched that and I was like wow that's the coolest thing I've ever seen yeah yeah like that is the closest thing you can get to a fighter jet on wheels yeah yeah. and from that point I was like hooked and that was sort of the catalyst that got me into cars and Mm. from that point I decided okay one day you know it's not my primary primary focus but once I've got some money coming in one thing I'd love to do is is buy a nice car and my favorite car brand is Lamborghini yeah And so I put a tweet out six or seven years ago saying, just as a joke, first tweet I've ever done, my next tweet will be a picture of my Lamborghini. And maybe it was a little bit pretentious, a little bit obnoxious. Lo and behold. It was more just um, as a joke, just for the bants. And, you know, I I picked one up in July this year. Yeah. And just posted um, the photo of the car saying six years later. Yeah, we'll pull it up on screen. Here it is. And more so just to make a point that, you know, you just set yourself a goal, believe it's possible, go out and do it. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into your motivation in terms of why you want to achieve success yeah. with businesses that you're involved in right now. But mm-hmm. I mean, moving forward from that, what are you actually doing with the money, personally speaking, in terms of money generating? So as you said, there with the info products around 100K per month with one, other yeah. 30, 40, obviously real estate investments as well. Mm-hmm. What is your objective, with, personally speaking, in terms of finances and how you regulate that or control it so, to optimize obviously revenue as well? Yes, I, I'm not one of these people that is trying to have a super, super lean, minimalist, minimalist lifestyle. Yeah. You know, I, I know I've got friends that are like that. Um, I know you're very good with your money. You don't mm. go crazy spending. And that's fine. For me, it's, you know, I've worked very hard and I like to enjoy the lifestyle that I've got. So yeah, it means having a nice car, 
nice apartment. Yeah. On the weekend, I'm going out for a nice dinner. Um, maybe every so often go on a nice holiday. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I pay myself X amount every month, which allows me to, to sort of live that lifestyle. Mm. And this year, especially in the last six months, it got to the point where, okay, well, I've sort of ticked off all those superficial lifestyle goals and they're very surface level goals. It's the Lamborghini being the yeah. ultimate of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, it is very surface level, but it's, you know, mm. get the car, get the apartment cool. And that's sort of the first box that needs to be ticked. The lifestyle goals are there. Now getting another car, getting a bigger apartment, mm. being able to go on an extra holiday here or there, or go to a, you know, the club and spend a little bit more money another time a week. Yeah. Isn't going to impress a girl. It's not going to make me any happy. Yeah. 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 And so, it was actually quite liberating this year. It's like, okay, well, all those superficial materialistic goals are ticked off. Yeah. And so now it then really made me think, okay, so I've always thought about it, but what do I really want to build now? Mm. And so yeah, in, in terms of my money, personally, I pay myself that, I have my lifestyle. And then now we're using that cash flow to just really go all back in on the business and build teams. We just about to hire six new people on the development company this year yeah. to help with the acquisition side of things. It allows us to outsource people to really, essentially what I'm trying to do now is build these businesses with the intention of removing myself from most of the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, so you can continue and to scale. So I can continue to scale and just work on the business. Get involved in other businesses in as well. But I'm at a point now where all the tasks within the business, I know how to do. I've paid my dues, I've done them. Yeah. And so now it comes, it's just training other people to delegate. do them for me. Yeah, optimizing um, that process. Delegate, so yeah. Uh, but I think that's also interesting in terms of what you touched on. So obviously the audience watching this will now know how much money you're generating. Mm -hmm. But I think what uh, needs to be kind of clarified also is that the money you are generating goes back into the real estate businesses in terms yeah. of building that team. Obviously the offices you're investing in as well mm -hmm. and how to scale that company also. Yeah. So in terms of the amount of money you actually see relative, yeah. relative to what you're earning is a bit different. Yeah, um, I'm, it's definitely not a case where every penny I've got coming in is going straight back out on cars yeah. and fancy dinners. And, which is a mistake that young people make. Which is a mistake a lot of young people make. Including myself and probably yourself. Yeah, oh yeah, I've, I've done it. I've, yeah. you know, I, I think a couple of years ago, I remember, you know, I was making decent money, but sometimes you get to the end of the month, you check your bank account. Like, yeah, it's where's like, it gone? Yeah. You go through your bank statements, you, you add all the transactions up, it's like... I spent that. That's bonkers, yeah. And you think, where did it go? Yeah. And, and ultimately that's going to stunt your growth. Yeah. You get stuck at that level. Yeah, it's great surface level, but other than that, not much. And you've got to be self-aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be prevalent in young people for sure. Mm -hmm. I think especially if it's a case of you want to get to that point, you've reached mm -hmm. that threshold, you have to obviously then milk it at certain points. But beyond yeah. that, I think it's really important to talk about how you're spending money, personally speaking. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. Like I've been in years in the past, very frugal, very lean. I'm at an age now, again, maybe I'm only 23, but... You, mate, you've been very lean at a certain yeah. point. Like I remember when we were having a conversation lockdown mm -hmm. pre-lockdown you're talking about moving back into london yeah and obviously the investment relatively to what you're earning in terms of the actual property you have right now mm -hmm. isn't particularly expensive your lifestyle mm -hmm. i wouldn't say is particularly expensive either it, it, Rel could, relative, it could be it could be yeah. way worse relative yeah. to what you're earning right now but then also you're spending times at home for what a year with your parents yeah. Yeah, 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 where yeah. you would just work on the info product yeah so when i sort of um i was living in london for about six months at the end of 2018 then decided actually you know i want to rebuild this new business i went moved back home it's my parents. We, we, we had calls where you were working at like 8 p.m. Oh, yeah. Still had more work to be done on the info product. You were totally restructuring everything. There was about, a tw this is what people don't see. So I had a friend of me ask me this year, um, like a few weeks ago, how, how, how did you get all this stuff so quickly? I'm like, what yeah. do you mean? He said, oh, like, obviously got the Lamborghini that, like a couple months ago. You got the new apartment a couple months ago. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but what they don't see is that the, obviously for the last however many years I've been working, but there was a 12 month period in my life in, um, 2019 pretty much where mm. I didn't speak to anyone. Yeah. Which ties into when we met. No one, yeah. no one, none of my friends heard from me. Yeah. I was getting text messages like, mate, are you okay? I've not heard from you for weeks. Yeah. And I just literally locked the windows, closed the doors and just went all in on rebuilding this new business Yeah. with the intention that, you know, I'm willing to go underwater for 12 months, Yeah. but I know it'll pay off. And yeah. And obviously I'll come out the other side, but yeah. So that 20, 2019 period also was when we met. Yes. So last summer, mm -hmm. well, last like June, July, I reckon. Yeah. I probably just got back from Bali. Yeah, that was around the start of my info product journey. And, and it, really I mean, we were at a party at the time mm -hmm. and there's what, 20, 25 people in the room maybe? Yeah, and so that was a really pivotal moment for me because I was obviously involved in the property space. I was also working as like a self-employed estate agent yeah. in like the luxury sector of the market. And so- Suited yeah, and booted. Suited and booted. Yeah. yeah, six, seven days a week. 
And in the environment I was in then, mm. it was good money to me was if you can make 10, 15, 20K a month. Yeah. Like if you make that in one month, you've had a solid month. Yeah. And there was, wasn't really many people I knew earning more than that. Mm. And the people I did know that were making that sort of money, because in the estate agency sector, it's, you know, all different walks of life. Mm. It was a lot of older people in their 30s, 40s. Yeah, yeah. I was really one of the youngest in the business. And then when we first met, it was really the first point I started to surround myself with people that were same age as me, mm. some younger, some a year or two older. And quite a lot younger as well, some people. Quite a lot younger. Yeah. And the conversations we were having, sort of the numbers that they were doing in their business and mm. how what levels they'd scale their business to, I was like, wow, okay, so it is possible to make six figures, even seven figures a month in your early 20s. Yeah. Which... I guess I didn't think it was impossible, but I didn't actually really know anyone that was doing it. Yeah, and there's no visual element to it. You couldn't put a face to a name. No, and actually what really stuck out for me, and I don't mean this from like an egotistical point of view, is you meet these people and you think, actually, they're smart guys, mm. but they're no smarter than maybe I could be if I applied my energy in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. It's nothing that they're doing that I couldn't do. Yeah. They're no, they're not born with an IQ that's way above mine or mm. supersedes yours. They've got extra hours in the day. Mm. I'll mention names because I think it's obviously quite important as well. So um, in terms of people in that room, Fred. Oh yeah. So I went the first day I met you at that party, Fred, who have become really good friends with. So um, he's CEO of Sanucci, for those yeah, that don't know. Jewelry brand yeah. um, that does really well. Matt as well, who's had a jewelry brand at the time, Midnight City, he's now got... Um, Neon Beach. Neon Beach Company. Super, They're both very successful boys in e-commerce. Very successful guys, yeah. very young and deserve every level of success. And, you know, they've grafted for it and, they, and they've earned it. Yeah. Um, there was Leo in the room as well. Leo. Obviously he's made an exit for, what was that, five mil or something? Like I, that. I don't know the numbers. Something but, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. And, exit at one point. Um, he's 22. Leo, at the time he was 22. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and obviously Eman was in the room as well. Yeah. And, and obviously that I was one of Eman's clients at the time. And yeah. It was just the, probably the first time I'd been in a room with people that were way, way above maybe the income I was generating at the time. Yeah. And that was in a really inspiring moment for me. Not so much because I think, wow, these people are making this much money. It's like, well, if they can do it, yeah, I can do it. <clears throat> it's almost like an insight in terms of what's behind the curtain. Yeah. Which we lack. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can listen to podcasts, you can buy info products, but there's a lack of actually meeting these people. And yeah. then a case of, okay, what are they doing day to day that's actually creating success? Yeah. What's their approach to things? Mm -hmm. How intelligent are they? Yeah. How can they hold a conversation? And then, okay, actually, sure. hang about. They're not mm -hmm. actually that clever. What's happening here? Or yes, yeah. they are to a certain degree, of course, but they have a yeah. basic level of intellect. They just inform themselves correctly. Of what I to think do. you ask any of them. You ask me. I don't think I'm that smart. No, I not agree. Not textbook smart. Uh, I, not, not, not on your, not, not on your yeah. path. Yeah, I'm not no, saying no. that. I mean, in terms of myself, personally speaking, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah. Like I, I, I've got friends that have done engineering degrees or degrees in finance. Like they're smart. Yeah. And yeah. wizards with numbers and whatever, and they can read through a textbook and just learn it like that yeah i'm not like that i got very average grades yeah in school and yeah but it's like we've discussed and maybe the premise of the podcast will be there's just a few guiding principles just a few things those mm. people do differently that just allow them to get levels above everyone else or force them to yeah in terms of your psychology because yeah. i think it's quite interesting what you're saying about school and obviously you met ben francis as well yes and he was talking about this on his podcast or his youtube videos he did where yeah. he's very average school grades mm -hmm. obviously he's very intelligent he's a very yeah. high level thinker mm -hmm. very average school grades didn't perform very well but that's because he had no motivation to do so sure. in terms of his school grades and he mm -hmm. saw no point of revising for a test studying for a test and then yeah. completing that repeating the same process six months later is that the same thought with you at school yeah i i be honest i never opened my a-level results to this yeah, day, I'm, I, I, telling me, yeah. I still have no idea what I got for my A levels. Yeah. I think I think I was maybe out of the country on holiday at the time. Obviously, results come out during the summer. Yeah, and I remember I, thought I was at a Tony Robbins event. Yeah, so I was at a Tony Robbins event with your dad. With with my dad, yeah. I think we were in Vegas. It was his business mastery event. We're on the flight back, mm. and that was the day you could go into the school, pick up your A-level results. Yeah. And I've just come back from this most intense five or six days of my mm. life. If anyone knows what Tony's events are like, they are crazy intensity. Music, to another level. lights, volume. It's mad. You start at 8 a.m., you finish at 2 a.m. Yeah. And you go again for five days. But yeah. the energy in the room is just nuts. And I just remember thinking like, I'm not going to university. Whatever these grades are has absolutely zero influence mm. on the direction of my life. Yeah and had no attachment to them at all and just never got around to it. And yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. There was really no 
real motivation for me to do well other than you know what my parents want me to do well my teachers want me to do well all my friends are revising yeah i'll put a few hours in yeah we can be a bit competitive about it yeah a if you choose to be but yeah. naturally there's no inclination to do so with school work no. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. Most individuals we work with or we're aware mm -hmm. of, it's the same for them, isn't it? Yeah. Incredibly intelligent people, but they have no motivational drive to do so at school yeah. and apply themselves particularly. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your motivation for success, what, what was that? What was the founding principle for you in terms of you were 18 at that point mm -hmm. prior to A-level results? So there's a lack yeah. of certainty in terms of what's going to be you know, next for you, what your future holds. Mm -hmm. But you knew you didn't want to be involved in education, you wanted to be obviously step outside, step outside the boundaries and explore yeah. what, was, what was there for you. What, what, why? Why did you want to do that? Was it a case of you were bored? Was it a case of you wanted to acquire huge amounts of wealth? Did you want it's, to travel, explore, see new things, push yourself? Um, what was it? It uh, Back then, yeah, very superficially it was, I just wanted to make money. Yeah. And I wanted to build something. I was always excited by the idea of building something big. And still to this day, I, I try and ask myself and figure out why, why am I doing this? Why am I wired the way I am? Why did you wake up and work? Yeah. Yeah. And why am I not just... I don't use the word happy because I am happy. Why am I not just satisfied making the money I'm making yeah. and just staying at that level? Mm. And I've all, for as long as I can remember, I've been wired this way. Yeah. I go back to when I was 12, 13. I was a kid selling sweets on the playground. Yeah. I've had multiple businesses that I've tried and failed. And um, yeah, for me, it was, I guess, I just wanted to make a lot of money I just wanted to live a life on my terms. Mm. It's the idea to me of going to a nine to five, being a part of the rat race, retiring at 55, 60, 65 with a pension. Yeah. Was just being the victim of other people's will. Exactly. Yeah. And so for me, it was, I want to live a life on my terms. I want the nice things. I want that nice lifestyle. Mm. And then as I've matured and got older, it's got to the point where actually, you know, I'm at a point now where, like I said, the lifestyle stuff's covered. I've got a nice lifestyle. If that gets any better, it's not actually going to make me exponentially happier. It's more of a case now. It's I just want to build something big. Yeah. And so I guess why I'm like that, I don't know. Mm. It's just I just want to see what my potential is, see what I can build and just keep building. But build something big, not as a representation of your own personal success, but actually build something you're proud of. Something I'm proud of, so. something big in terms of the impact that has on this world. Because obviously that ties into the element of personal branding. Do you want to be known more so as being individual personal brand wise in terms of being a celebrity in the entrepreneurship space or is it a case of you want to create an incredible empire in terms of real estate and then step away from that at some point um there's for me there's an emphasis on building an audience and a personal brand right now because there are a lot of benefits to that of for course. example for me you know i i held last week 12 interviews for some new roles in the business. All those 12 interviews came from social media. Yeah, and we, the individuals that we meet through social media as well. Yeah, the contacts I've made through social media and what that's turned into is just, yeah. um, you know, the, you can't even, it's intangible, um, mm. the level of value. But when you're referring to actually building something, when I refer not, to building something building. big, my main focus is I want to build, whether it's, you know, a company, a business, a brand, mm. have a huge impact on this earth first yeah as a result of that i think it's just inevitable that you will then become someone who's well known anyone Absolutely. that's made a serious impact on this earth yeah every, jeff bezos elon musk yeah of course whoever so ben most recently yeah of course yeah of course so obviously at this point it's quite clear so you're very successful at a young age mm -hmm. and there's an element of we've kind of highlighted that quite clearly yeah what are you bad at what am I bad at? What, um, what are the behaviors or habits that are stunting business growth right now? In terms of, it could be anything. It could be a poor more evening routine, morning routine. It could be a case of you're hanging around with the wrong people, your psychology approach to things. What is it that's holding you back? Yeah, so I think it's important to start my answer with saying that I am absolutely no Superman. I am nowhere near operating at 100%. And I don't want to give the audience that false impression that yeah. I'm someone that's optimized to the 0.1% degree and just well, yeah because they might think that having heard that you can generate 200k a month for your business yeah, I, yeah. I don't I don't want people to think that I am this godlike that's doing everything to the best of my ability and mm. that's what's resulted it's actually yeah. I just I'm good at a few things and do a few things better than um others in terms of what I'm bad at though but th those key traits in terms of what you've been good at actually mm -hmm. there's, there's tie into that also it's a case of knowing how to market yourself use yeah. Facebook ads build mm -hmm. a product which actually delivers results for customers yeah and work in a vehicle which is going to create financial success it's it's understanding the basics of business building systems understanding leverage yeah you know, being able to remove yourself from systems and putting procedures in place that don't depend on you there thinking in terms of scale yeah 
and reinvesting consistently reinvesting particularly uh, uh, with info products you'll yeah. get that wrong all the time and and emphasis on the service delivery yeah you you can't scale you can have the best marketing in the world but you can't scale it if it's a bad product particularly with the 5k product yeah because it'll bite you in the ass yeah absolutely eventually yeah um yeah so what what are some of the behaviors which you're currently experiencing or currently expressing or conducting which are poor um so i think a lot of it comes down to one of the most important things is discipline. Yeah. And discipline is just doing the things you should be doing, even when you don't want to do them. And for me, yes, I'm disciplined. There are a few non-negotiables in my life. It's go to the gym five days a week at least. Mm. Um, or, you know, just do hard stuff. Like the run we did this morning. It's, yeah. I woke up at like nine o'clock thinking, I do not want to do this run. Yeah, yeah. But I know that you just need to do hard shit. Absolutely. Um, and that's so important for the yeah. brain non-negotiables in terms of, you know, the work output I put in. But I'll be honest, when you work for yourself, it's very hard to be disciplined because you don't have a boss that, you know, if you get, if, if when you're an employee, mm. it's you get in at nine, you leave at six because you know there's someone there that's looking over you and is going to punish you if you don't. Yeah. With, when you work for yourself, you know, you take a week off work and you, or you slack on work, you get punished in six months time. Yeah. And so that immediate feedback loop isn't there. So my, I'm which, not the most disciplined. Which I think is really important to stress. Yeah. Particularly with one particular individual that we're both aware of mm -hmm. who's now going to experience that. Uh, yeah. In terms of the past year or two, having not been particularly well optimized nor conducive to success, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. And, and you can, time will tell. And yeah. when, when you're in the businesses that we're in, it's, there's such like a delayed, the results were always delayed. The yeah. work, the, you know, your results today are the product of the work you did 12 months ago. Yeah. And the work you're doing today is going to give you the results in 12 months time. Mm. And so in terms of things I'm bad at to give you some specifics, um, I'm, I'm not the best at sticking to the same routine in yeah. terms of, you know, one thing that I'm really trying to focus on now is just waking up and going to bed at the same time yeah. every single day, mm. because from working to get together, we've established my sleep it hasn't always been one of my biggest strength points, but mm. That's one thing I'm trying to work on. Um, in terms of getting work done throughout the day, I think I find it very hard to go eight, nine, 10, 12 hours yeah. with high intensity for the whole day, yeah. especially for multiple days at a time. So I just said to myself, look, if I can just get four hours of deep work done yeah. in the morning, phone off, no distractions, no notifications. Yeah. From that, I'd maybe do some more creative work later on in the day. Yeah, I'll end up doing more than four hours work most days. Yeah, of course. But that's a non-negotiable baseline level. level. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm bad at that, and I guess other things such as um, anything in terms of people you're surrounding yourself with. Um, I surround myself with good people. Yeah. Um, that's one thing I'm very good at, and. I'm very protective over my time and energy now. Yeah, massively so. You're very disciplined in that respect and you remove yourself from yeah, I, bad I, situations. I've got to, you know, if there's friends that just aren't adding value into my life, I will yeah. be very selfish and, you know, spend less time with them and protect my time and energy because I think you just do have to be selfish in this world, whether you like it or not. Agreed, yeah, yeah. No, massively. Okay, interesting. What ventures have you previously failed with? Okay, so... So Probably, again, have, having explored your story from 18, it seems like you've been on an upward curve the whole time. So what have you actually failed with at this yeah, point? Yeah, so it definitely was not a case that I left school, started going into property and it all just went well from there. In terms of maybe when I was younger, I, what did I try to do? One of the first business I had was buying and selling iTunes vouchers on eBay. No way. So I would Quality. literally bid on them for like that's brilliant yeah like maybe like a 25 pound itunes voucher yeah i'd buy it for like 22 pounds sell it for 24 pounds right okay like making pennies Perfect margin yeah like pennies but the way i saw it if what, i can make what about postage no, joking. well so that <laughs> so that was a thing so i remember yeah. i probably made like one week maybe like 150 pounds yeah which when you're like 14 15 the six. i was like yeah decent. it's class yeah, like yeah when you've got no overheads yeah. life's so simple when you're that age yeah and then I remember at the end of the month, I got spanked with like an invoice for like eBay fees and PayPal fees and shipping fees. I was like, okay, that's all my margins gone. Yeah. That business didn't work. Yeah. I then tried to move into the affiliate marketing space. Right. So okay. people are familiar with like ClickBank where you can then be an affiliate for other products. Yeah. Tried that, shot loads of videos, tried to do YouTube content that failed. Um, then went and started, imported a load of, 
watches on Alibaba, which I tried to then sell at school. As a brand? Uh, no, no, just just like oh, really? just literally importing just importing them. Cheap and watches, yeah. Cheap watches and trying okay. to sell them. And You're the new movement. Yeah. Yeah. Flopped. Yeah. <laughs> never took off. Then launched a jewelry brand, funnily enough, which okay. is so funny because I see what Math did with history brand, what Fresh from history brand. Yeah. And it was literally just um, bracelets and they were like beads with like a metal gold plated, I think different animals like a lion or yeah. whatever. Tried to market that, got a few influencers to post it. Like hardly any sales came in. I remember this one night, me and my friend who I was in business with, we had all these influencers posting at this one time at night. We, he bought a bottle of champagne around to think, right, all the sales are going to come in. Yeah. No sales came in. Oh, got it. And yeah. so we didn't even pop the bottle of champagne. Oh, no, um, really? Yeah. So oh. <laughs> shout out to Jordan on that one. Uh, started a clothing brand. So this was as a project at school with a group of friends. Um, clothing brand called Vibe. And, you know, we we turned like 500 pounds into like seven grand. Yeah. Over the course of six months. Okay. And, you know, we had it at a few shops, had it at my barber shop, they were selling it. We had Sophie Turner from Game of Thrones wearing no, it and giving saying, us shout yeah. outs. Yeah, yeah. And that did well, but again, never materialized anywhere. And looking back, I could, I know exactly where we went wrong on all these. Mm. I then started another clothing brand after that on my own, okay. which was clothing made from bamboo. Okay. Flopped. That was a trend. Sold a few. Yeah. yeah. Didn't really work. I basically bought a couple t-shirts from Urban Outfitters where I liked the shape. Okay. Sent them off to China. I said, just make these same t-shirts, but in bamboo. That flopped. Um, there's there's more and more. I probably can't think of them all right we'll now. Listen, five or six already. And that's yeah. all before the age of 18 or around that time That period? would have been before 18. Wow, okay. Yeah. It's quite interesting. And what, what sacrifice have you made at this point to be successful? Um, and that's obviously, that's a very individual question, I think, it's fair to say as well, because some things don't feel like a sacrifice to you, but to others, they may do. Yeah. So, so for you personally speaking, what sacrifices have you made? That's a good point. So a lot of things maybe I've sacrificed don't feel like a sacrifice because for me, it's just the obvious route to go down. Yeah. Like for you, for example, like working, you know, solid hours in the day or not going out to see friends at certain points or removing that social contact from certain people that aren't going to age you. That's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Some people for you, not the much. Yeah. Smart. So for example, when I was working as an estate agent, I was working six, seven days a week yeah. and I, was sacrificing time in that respect and yeah. from that socializing and didn't really spend much time with friends. When we talked about the period last year where I took 12, close to 12 months out to just not speak to one, I sacrificed socializing, going out, traveling. Relationships. Relationships. Yeah. Um, I was in a relationship, but sort of broke down. One of the variables that contributed to that was just my focus on work at the time. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of it is just a sacrifice in terms of time and just doing the things that, other people don't want to do. Did those things take their toll on you? Um, for example, like one of them, which is probably more prominent for some people, be relationship, for example. Mm -hmm. and obviously the demise of that or breakdown of that slowly, potentially as well. For some people, that's very painful to go through an experience and it kind of corrupts their business in terms of their energies towards it. Yeah, it was, I think painful is too strong of a word. It was, uh, yeah. you know, a, a period in my life where you know, a lot of growth, a lot of learning about what I want, what I don't want. Yeah. Um, in terms of relationships nowadays, yeah, I do sacrifice dating a little bit. I don't invest much time into seriously dating or... Which is, or I find very interesting as well. Okay. Well, I think it's either or, isn't it, for some people. It's yeah. a case of some people want to be in a relationship which supports their business because they have mm -hmm. the right partner with them, but yeah. other people want to be more single. Yeah. What's your, what was your perspective on that? So I had this conversation when I was running earlier with, with Jack he yeah. asked, what's my opinion? Same question on, yeah. do you think having a relationship, being in a relationship or being single is more conducive to success in the long run? Yes. My answer is, one, there is no right answer. Yeah, I totally agree. Two, it completely depends on your personality type. Massively. And on the partner that you choose to be with. Yeah. And I'm someone that, just like yourself, wired very differently to other people, mm. very obsessive personality, very obsessed with what I want to achieve and with my vision. And for me, that is probably one of the most important things in my life. Yeah. And if I am going to be with any partner, it's got to be a partner that understands that, understands why I'm wired the way I am. Well, understand that they're not the priority. Yeah. Um, Which sounds awful, but it's, it's, it's true. It sounds awful, but I always say, but if I ever, when, if I ever do get into a relationship, but you know, but we, my I mean, priority we, will we be my work. Loads of times. Like but, we were listening to Eddie Hearn, weren't we? With Stephen yeah. Bartlett's, Bartlett's podcast. And he was saying that, you know, works as priority at all times. 
Yeah. He's pushing his kid on a swing. Mm-hmm. It's 10 in the morning or they just finished school and he's still sending messages on his email. Yeah. But if you're with a partner, you dedicate, right. But when you're with them, you dedicate, whether it's date night, whether it's an hour in the evenings, yeah. all your time and energy is on them. Yeah. But if they're too high maintenance, I think you will struggle to succeed as an entrepreneur if you've got high maintenance girlfriend. Totally. Trump, Trump said that as well. Trump, watching him say he that. did say that. Yeah. And also someone that plays with your emotions too much because- yeah. You know, if anyone's ever been through heartbreak or been in a toxic relationship. Mm. Or been manipulated. Or been manipulated. By anyone at any point. That it could be takes, a friend or girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it, it is. It takes a toll on your energy. Massive. And you can't focus and your productivity levels drop to close to zero. Yeah. And it's all almost subconscious. Mm-hmm. I honestly think that's one of the most prevalent things that people are dealing with, not necessarily aware of, mm-hmm. in terms of which contributes to a failure or failure to achieve something. Yeah. Because it's so subconscious. Mm-hmm. It's something which you're processing all the time whilst you are working. Yeah. Nonetheless, like no matter how, if your personal life's very dramatic, mm-hmm. it's very hard to sit down and focus. Yeah. Very, very I difficult. I think you, you need, it's a must, a low maintenance partner. Yeah, absolutely. Someone or someone who's aligns with your vision in terms of what you want yeah. to achieve and wants to be part of that process mm-hmm. as well and has their own things going on. For sure. Which is, I think some men may agree, is quite difficult to find in a, in a female partner, particularly yeah, sure. at our age. Having made like a certain amount yeah. of money, you know, flexing that element of lifestyle a little bit more as well. Yeah. It's quite hard to come into contact with those kind of girls. Yeah. But but being single on the flip side, it's a case of, you know, there are pros and cons to being single. One, you've got the freedom element. So if I just wanted to travel to Dubai for three weeks on a whim like I did, like did last yeah. month, I don't have to check in with a girlfriend, but like, baby's okay if I do this. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I can go out and I can work in the office till 10 p.m. and not feel guilty that mm. I'm not spending time with my girlfriend. I think another thing that people don't mention is um, it also means that your decisions are your decisions alone. Yes. In terms of what feeds that. There's no... It's just it's just your personal opinion rather than it being a case of someone might have yeah. said something and drip fed that to you and then yep. you then come to make a decision and mm-hmm. realise actually it's probably not my decision, it's someone yeah. else's. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. quite interesting as well and that can obviously then you know, influence who you spend time with or what you're spending time on. Yeah. The only advice, I'd, the only downside to being single, the only advice I'd give is just don't get distracted by being single and dating and yeah. trying to chase women because you can end up wasting too much time doing or that. Or living like a rap star. Yeah. 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 Which is quite difficult in London at times. Yeah. Particularly if you're young, going out, get a table. Oh, for sure. It adds up. Oh, if you wanted to, yeah, you could go and have a lot of fun every single night in the city. So what, what's your choice on that? What's your pick on that in terms of, do you want to go out and still have fun in terms of going partying, have nights yeah. out, enjoy that element of things, or do you want to be like a disciplined monk? What's your perspective? No, I, I'll be the first to admit, I love I love going out to the club. I love sort of, so the way I see it is, right now my time's split between being in the Midlands, in my office. Some weeks now it's gonna be Monday to Wednesday, some weeks Monday to Friday. Yeah. Whatever it is, Monday to Friday. I work Saturday as well, but Monday to Friday I get shit done. Mm. it's with a level of intensity that's just so high. I get shit done. I make things happen. Yeah. When it comes to the weekend, whether I go out Friday night, Saturday night, go to the club, go out for a nice dinner, a yeah. few friends. Again, great for networking mm. and just have fun and enjoy myself. When Tyler says get shit done as well, just mm-hmm. to emphasize, I was looking at your metrics last week. You're in bed by nine o'clock and awake by what, six o'clock in the morning the next day? Yeah, yeah. So At least three days of that last week. One of the if we, we talk about discipline, one of the best ways to be more disciplined and change your behaviors is to change your environment. Massively. And being up in the Midlands where my office is, mm. is a bit of a tactical move in the sense that I don't have many friends up there. Yeah. There's not much to do in the evenings, especially not on the weekdays. Yeah. And so I go to the office, maybe go to the gym, I'll go to the gym, but then there's not much else to do. Yeah. And so, you know, I go to the office, I go to the gym, I come back, there's nothing to do. I yeah. just go to sleep, wake up early, get in the office, six seven a.m now and then do the same and yeah so that's what i mean yeah get shit done when it comes to friday saturday yeah i, I don't feel guilty about maybe i'm not being too disciplined yeah have a little bit fun on a sunday like we, like we've done this week last week it's you still do a 10k run yeah 15k run like we did today yeah even though last night i was up to like half one two a.m tequila bad food vodka yeah but like i said if, if you but do you think it's important to blow off steam in yes. terms of feeding productivity, because obviously those two nights, for example, could have been blowouts, as you would refer to it, but they've been something which has contributed to your success in terms of productivity. Yeah. And they're controlled blowouts. Yeah, very it's controlled. Last night, I knew the whole time that I've still got to be up at 10 a.m., yeah. I'm still got to meet Billy, and yeah. I'm still going to hit a 15K run. Yeah, and we've both been in environments where we've been out partying and whatnot, and there's been people taking drugs or yeah. overdoing it in terms of what they're drinking. We just removed ourselves from that very quickly. Oh, yeah. So again, non negotiable for me is I never and never will touch drugs. Yeah. I will never drink myself into oblivion. Yeah. 
and if I'll never be up partying after parties till like six, seven a.m. Yeah, because that's just too much of an extreme. And then the second and third order consequences of that going into the next day and the next week, compromise week, are just detrimental. You're done. Yeah, yeah. We'd be going to bed at two in the morning the next mm-hmm. week. It'd be so difficult to recover from that for sure. So interestingly, why did you choose to have an apartment in London? Um, first of all, many reasons. First of all, it's a very inspiring space for me. Yeah. The city itself, but also the actual environment and apartment that I'm in. Yeah. It's, you know, I wanted somewhere with amazing views. It's sick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sick. And I wake up and I, you know, wake up filled with gratitude and inspired. And it's sort of part of the feedback loop in the sense that, well, I've worked really hard. It's allowed Mm. me to live this amazing lifestyle that I'm so grateful for, yeah. which then reinforces all of the behaviors that I've had that have allowed me to get contributed to it. Yeah. Contributed to it from that being in London, the circle and network here is just on another level. Yeah. It's a joke to other people. I can't have these same inspiring conversations that I have with people here anywhere else in the country Yeah, and not to the level and not to the volume and frequency that I have them here. Mm. Um, the people that I surround myself here push me more than anywhere else. Yeah, like we can go out for dinner with yeah. multi-millionaires every day. Yeah. and Pretty much. Liquid as well. Yeah. And if you want to meet cool people, you'll meet them here. And if yeah. you want to go to nice restaurants, you do it here. I like going out for nice food and right out. And this is the best place to do it. Yeah. And shout then, out Novikov. Shout out to Novikov. <laughs> yeah. And Oksana. Novikov. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. And what what in terms of your belief process or your kind of thought process towards success have you mm-hmm. always believed you're going to be successful from a young age or is there yeah. any element of insecurity which kind of fueled your success i'm so this is an interesting topic i've been very lucky and we've talked about this before that um i've had a great upbringing in terms of the two best role model parents i could have asked for yeah they're and legends. that was yeah. one of the the most prominent lessons they ever taught me mm. especially my dad is never allowed to use word can't Okay. It's not in the vocabulary. Yeah. So every time, even from as, as earliest memories, if I was to say, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, yeah. he'd stop me. Yeah. Like, what was that? One? And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. And from that, and then from, you know, self-educating myself and whatever, it began to evolve into a belief system. That actually, I can do anything. You then go and do, you know, an Ironman triathlon. You go and do yeah. um, some endurance events like that, like Kilimanjaro that, when you first start training with them, you think there's no way I can do this, Mm. but then you do it and then you achieve things, you hit goals and it just becomes this self-fulfilling cycle that actually I, the capability of the human body myself is way beyond anything I can comprehend. Yeah. And And mental toughness. And I genuinely believe, and this is probably a bit out there that I can do anything that I set my mind to Mm. probably to the point of delusion. Yeah. But I've probably deluded myself into thinking I can do anything, but when I set a goal, I think that's required. It's required. Yeah. Any goal that I've set that I've still got for the future, in my mind, it's already done. Yeah. I've just got to wait for time to catch up. I want to walk into a room, have a goal, make people aware of it, and then be totally doubtful of what I could achieve. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way to move forward. Yeah. If, if you're not doing that, then either mm-hmm. you're not dreaming big enough or mm-hmm. you're with the wrong people, I think, as well. well. You've seen in my apartment, I've got sort of 10 or 12 principles written out and printed out and framed. Yeah. One of those principles is uh, delusional optimism. Yeah. Which states anything I want to happen has already happened. Yeah. Time just hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. And it's literally that I just believe the income goals I've got, the business goals I've got, they will happen. Mm. It's just, I've got to go out and do it and I've got to wait for time to catch up. But that self-belief is critical and it just stems from one thinking big, believe you can then do it and then just go and do it. Was insecurity ever a factor? No. In terms of drive and motivation? No. Really? Never at all? Never. In, in any facet? And it could be physical, it could be in terms of those physical challenges you put yourself through relationships, success in business um, in particular? Or has there been any element of that or is it a case of, I think it's fair to say you're very emotionally stable. I'm very emotionally stable. I'm, I'm very- and Honestly, very emotionally stable. But is there any element of that at all? No. No? No. Okay, really interesting. Yeah. At all, any facet? Um, Don't get me wrong, like sometimes doubt creeps into your mind a little bit. Yeah. But then you just shift your focus back to- um, you get yourself into a place of certainty and conviction. Mm. That, that's that's one thing I always try and do is whenever I do something, I, I, my intention is to do it with as much conviction and certainty as possible. Yeah. And remove I think doubt. you epitomize that, if I'm total yeah. honesty. Yeah. How important is happiness to you? Oh, obviously very important. But And what what is that for you? 
Is it something which you're chasing day to day? Is it something which you're chasing long term in terms of you want to attain your goal in business? What what is it to you? Um, I'm I don't chase happiness. Mm. I'm a very happy individual and I don't think that's by accident. That's by understanding human psychology, human mindset, certain guiding principles. I think one of the biggest keys to being happy is just gratitude. Yeah. And I'm sure there's people listening. But not, not necessarily in the cliche way that you would expect in terms of sitting down with a diary every no. morning and writing 10 things you're grateful for. Oh yeah. Like, a lot of people say, oh yeah, get your diary out, write down in the morning, all these things you're grateful for. Yeah. I'm just naturally a very grateful person. It's not like, oh, yeah. I'm grateful for the nice apartment or the nice cars I have. It's I'm just grateful that... I'm alive and breathing. Yeah, exactly. And, and have the opportunity to do stuff. And have the opportunity to do to play a banging song every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, small Just things like that. Small things. Yeah. And I don't chase happiness. For me, I think I'll always be happy. And yeah, it's just something that's, it's an inside job and it's something I've worked on and mm. it's then one of those things I've just ticked off. And then once you've ticked that off, it just allows you to go and chase the other stuff. Absolutely. And what's your Northern Star? What's your Polaris Star? So Ash, what's continuing to motivate you to succeed, having achieved a certain lifestyle level or point in which no matter how much money you make now, not much is going to change because yes, you could jet off to Dubai. You could get yeah. another car if you wanted to. You could get another apartment. It's, it's, you, you it's nothing materialistic anymore. Pull. Yeah. You could do all of those things. Um, it's. So I think that's, it's more so a conversation around complacency, I think. Yeah. And that's, and but going back to what I talked about earlier about when you tick off all those lifestyle goals mm. this year and you really have to think, okay, well, what do I really want to build? It's very easy to be complacent because actually I could do very little work now with the systems I've built and the business I've built and live this same lifestyle. At this immediate point. At this immediate point. Yeah. Granted, that'll catch up with me. Six months. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, you really have to dial in on why am I doing this? Mm. And then why am I going to get up and put, level of intensity in this week yeah into my work i mean you're fortunate enough to have met ben francis and yeah. been for a cheeky nando's with him as well yeah obviously that individual is now worth r roughly a billion yeah obviously that's not liquid but roughly mm -hmm. a billion and in terms of his continued drive it was the brand and his ambition with gymshark yeah it's been nothing more so than that in terms of personal wealth and accumulation of that mm -hmm. it was a very humble and modest life which is quite interesting yeah and doesn't care one bit for the materialistic things um so what was it? normal house normal car normal house girlfriend dog normal car and you can just tell all not all always he cares wears gymshark like yeah. you know apple his, watch his one thing is building that brand to be the biggest brand in mm. the sportswear industry what was your biggest takeaway from him um probably nothing that i didn't already know but it just emphasized a few certain things for me mm. one is a very focused individual yeah just having a conversation with him you can see how focused he is on the brand. He knows the metrics behind the business. Mm. Also, I guess the flip side of focus is he has eliminated many distractions from his life. What, was, what did he say to you? Something about his personal life and his business life in terms of, I want a very complex business life, very simple personal life. Yeah. And we discussed being in London versus being in the Midlands where their headquarters is. And he made the same point I made earlier in the Midlands. Mm. There is nothing to do yeah. other than just work, mm. which is a good thing if that's all you want to do. Yeah. And so they get a lot of stuff done and it, it comes down to, yeah, focus, very disciplined. He said he goes to the bed at the same time every night, wakes up at the same time every morning. Yeah. And that's very clear to see. Yeah. Very clear to see. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So how do you further educate yourself at this point? So Obviously there's access to info products, there's access to books, podcasts. What's um, been the most prevalent thing for you? So before it was, there was a point actually. So the first year I left school, after I left school, I remember I got to the end of the year. I can't remember what year it was, but I calculated one ev every five days. Mm. I was either on a course or a seminar or a training program or something. From every, that young. From, yeah. That's young. Yeah. Like even if it was these free events you can go to just yeah. whether it's a networking event or a free property event it was every five days. Yeah. Um, it was, I can't remember what the total amount of days was, but it was a lot. Yeah. And so that, that was one thing I did back then would listen to audiobooks, YouTube videos for me, even when I was at school, you know, I'd come back, I'd spend two hours on YouTube, just watching Tony Robbins or, yeah um zig ziglar or all these guys or just mm. type in motivational videos mm, yeah and yeah. thinking it's productive yeah. and i guess it was because no, you know it, was, it, it sparked it, a fire yeah. yeah 
And but nowadays it's I, I don't read books physically. It's yeah. I listen to audiobooks. I think it's a much more effective way for me to learn anyway. I don't enjoy reading. Um so put an audiobook on, double speed, podcasts. But now I'm at a point where I I know what I need to do to grow my business. Mm. It's now I'm more focused on the specifics to my business. So the courses I invest in now is predominantly where I do most of the learning, but they're courses that are very specific to my business models. Um, so and example, particular difficulty you're facing slash yeah. to optimize for. Yeah. So for example, with the education side of the program, you know, it's, you know, one of the biggest factors is making sure the ads are optimized. Yeah. And optimizing and so, nuances of the funnel. Exactly. So investing in programs that really help you scale funnels like that to yeah. the nth degree. So that that's where most of the practical learning comes from. Do you feel like further education is needed in order to acquire success? Yes. And I think it's almost ties into the next question as well in terms of health and how you optimize that also, whether that's needed for success. Mm -hmm. But for example, there's individuals like George Heaton, that mm -hmm. CEO I represent. We listened to their podcast. Sure. You didn't even know what half the books they're talking about were. Yeah. So it's quite clear to see there's an element of, of lack in that respect, but something which we focus on heavily. It's it's easy to fall down a rabbit hole, I think, of trying to learn too many things. Overconsumption, particularly young people. Yeah. And it, particularly in the info product space. Yeah. And I think if you found what you want to focus on, you found your one thing, whether that's a business, a business model, the industry you want to go into, mm. you need to be yeah, constantly learning about health and how yeah. to optimize your health, constantly learning about mindset and how to improve your mindset and discipline yeah. and routines. But then just get really clear on learning things very specific to your business. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then allowing time to actually carry them out. Exactly. Because by the time you completed your morning routine, meditated, <laughs> done all these things, it's already one o'clock in the afternoon. Exactly. In some cases. And finding what works for you. Yeah. And trialing certain things because there are certain things that work for some people, there are certain things that work for me. Mm. For me, I don't need to do the journaling every day, the meditation every day. For me, the meditation is the 20 or 30 minute drive of having the car to the office or, or training or, or training in the yeah. gym. That's for me, that's my headspace mm. or the gratitude thing. I'm just grateful throughout the day. I just catch myself and think, wow, like yeah. what a life. Yeah. So, Did you ever feel pressured into adhering to these routines and systems? Which, um, which if, if for example, you need to look up what do you need, what behaviors do you need to express or carry out in order to achieve success? You, you begin they, they to believe, up. yeah, you begin to believe that's what you need you to be to doing. It. Yeah. You, you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk saying he only you need to sleep four hours a day. Yeah. I remember when I was started one of my first clothing brands, mm. I remember seeing a YouTube video I saw about Donald Trump only sleeps four hours a day. Oprah Winfrey only sleeps four hours a day, yeah. which is probably all bullshit. Yeah. Oh, of course. And they'd be dead. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember, yeah, for like two or three nights in a row, yeah. I tried to survive a four hour sleep and I was like, maybe I'm just not that disciplined. Maybe I'm not wired for this. Yeah. No, I remember thinking I, that as well. I can't yeah. do early starts. I, for me, I, I find it very hard to consistently for a long period of time, wake up at 5am or 6am. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, I'd rather just stick to 7am, 7.30, 8am. Yeah. But maybe go to sleep a little bit later because mm. I actually, my, some of my most productive hours are in the evenings. Yeah. So what are some of your most non-negotiable behaviors and routines? And that can be from a perspective of health routines, can be from a perspective of in terms of work and certain time periods, which you do work communication, whatever it may be. Um, in terms of non-negotiables or daily routines, it's I do strive, don't always achieve it, to get that at least seven, really eight hours, seven to eight hours of sleep a night, Yeah, um, which is something I'm working on and yeah. I'm not perfect at. And that's going to come from implementing certain protocols like same sleep time, same awake time. Mm. And discipline. Is the and, main, and discipline. Discipline is the main overarching theme there. Yeah, And going to the gym at least one, like once a day, yeah, five, six days a week, non-negotiable. Yeah. And course. I think anyone that's doing that, isn't doing that is, is just shooting themselves in the foot. Shooting themselves yeah, in the foot. It's a joke. Yeah. And just taking their health for granted mm. and don't really fully comprehend the consequences of, of not doing that. Yeah. Then really, like I said, it's just getting those four hours of deep work done, mm. eating right. That's it. Keep yeah. it very simple. Just get those few things done. The rest will fall into place. Phone use. Um, exposure to dopamine. I'm very self aware of it and self conscious of it, mm. and I try not to get stuck into social media and spend hours on Instagram. But it comes down to those four hours when I'm working, the phone's off. Yeah, or at least on airplane mode. All my communication is on Slack, which I've got on WhatsApp. So only people I need to sp um, on my laptop, which yeah. only people I need to speak to, of course, can communicate. Can with communicate you with me. Yeah. Anybody else is sort of irrelevant. What about? Um for example, phone use in the evening when you're relaxing. 
and then that bleeding into the next day in terms of having almost like a hangover from attention. Um, okay, so another non-negotiable for me now is I don't sleep with my phone in my bedroom. Yeah. Because I could easily try myself my, tell myself, oh, I'm not going to use my phone before bed or whatever. Yeah. If I just say I'm not going to have my phone in my room, when I go to bed, my phone's not there for me to get sucked into a YouTube hole or Instagram hole for 30 minutes. It yeah. also means when I wake up, I'm not just going to lie in bed and go on social media for 30 minutes. Yeah. And so when my phone's in my Which room- Which totally ruins your ability to be productive. It does. Yeah. So now when I wake up, it's I wake up, I'm awake- if I want to go check my phone, I've got to go into the other room. By mm. that point, I'm already up. I may as well have a shower. Can't be bothered to even go and get, get the phone. ready. Yeah. So it's just small things like that. It's, you know, don't sleep my phone in the room. Simple thing. And don't check Instagram first thing. Yeah. Simple. Mm -hmm. Very simple behaviours, but something people confuse all the time. Yeah. Intra what, what's your thoughts with the info product space as it currently stands? Um, and individuals who are perceived as being gurus or influential people in that space. There's a big lack of authenticity. Mm. which is what I have a huge focus on now. It's with everything that I do, I want to be with radical transparency and complete authenticity. Absolutely. And that I believe then actually makes your product more attractive. It makes you more attractive, makes people want to buy into you more. I agree. In terms of- And will win long term. And, and you'll win long term. Rather than the short term. Because you can only bullshit people for so long and eventually it will catch up with you. Yeah, and you may make cash short term, but that'll be it. Exactly. And so, and have your reputation totally ruined, your audience compromised. Yeah. And, you're and gone. for some people, it may be inevitable, but mm. I believe my belief system and what I build it's have, yes, the best possible marketing, but make sure our service delivery is to just an excruciatingly high standard. Yeah. And, you know, my mission with property, the education side is raise the standards in property education. I think really everyone should be doing that across every info product space. Yeah. And, that should it's, be their objective. That should be their Absolutely. objective. And really, I think too many people, their focus is on how, not how much, is how much money can I make from this info product by selling it? It's actually, let me just build the best possible product possible. Yeah, and your scale. And your scale. And from a result of that, you will make, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll generate an income, but you'll also impact a lot of lives as well. So your personal table marketing isn't too extreme? I think marketing can be very simple. Mm if you have a good product and a good funnel. Yeah. And the current use of your marketing in terms of the copy isn't too extreme. Isn't too extreme. It's, we don't sell any dreams. It's, yeah, it's very not, simple. Yeah. And, and even if, you know, if people, someone goes for a program and it's not for them, if, you know, they want their money back, we just offer a, a full refund. But so, yeah. So in, in terms of particular nuances, what is your thought process on marketing in the info product space then in terms of copy or claims being made? Um, do you think it is too extreme or is it something which you personally experienced or? I think there are a lot of people that sell a dream. They show this lifestyle, which they're not really living. And the only reason they're living that lifestyle is to sell it's more through of their, their products. info products. Yeah. And that's is not, baffling. It, it is baffling. It's also, I think you've got to also, the audience has to take a little bit of responsibility. They have to realize that actually, um, what these people are doing and actually think, okay, well, do you, they need to see, read through the lines a little bit. Of course. Um, do something as simple as check company's house as well. Yeah. Check, yeah, check company's house. Things. Obviously it's not always an accurate reflection. Of, no, of course not. Of but I mean, it's just finances. like a basic step to take. Nonetheless, it's a basic step and yeah. And, and do your research and, but yeah, I just think the general standards need to improve. What's, what's been your experience with ads in terms of outsourcing it or competing it yourself? Um, so I first started out paying, I've, I've used two agencies now to try and run my ads. Mm. And at first it was because from a point that it was so complex, it looked so complex. Yeah. The Facebook ad platform just it's incredibly looked, foreign. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredibly foreign and almost a little bit daunting. And I thought, you know what? Yeah. I'd rather just pay someone that's an expert at this to do it for me. Yeah. And it means Absolutely. I don't have to spend all the time learning this. It, didn't really work out mm. and that's because an agency is never really going to understand your customer your funnel your audience as well as you will yeah but also i just believe like everything in life you have to take responsibility yeah and so at that point it would have been very easy for me to blame the agency and say oh the agent agency shit whatever yeah whether they're good or bad it doesn't matter mm. i need to take responsibility okay well i'm gonna go out and learn how to do ads yeah and you spend the next six months learning going deep and in learning ads to you know a high level mm. so i can really scale this product 
And so, yeah, learned, learned to run ads myself. And so, as a result, you've had more success because you've, again, you said you've taken responsibility of that. Yeah, as a result, I've had more success. I did then try and use an agency again because I thought, well, now I know how to use the ads. I can have those more meaningful conversations with the agency. Yes. I understand my customer now and I understand what works and it's more just from a convenience standpoint that I work with an agency. Again, didn't really work out whether that was the agency's fault or not. I don't know, but yeah. Um, now I just run the ads myself and I think it's one of those skills that, yeah, I'll train someone to, to come in house and maybe do it for me. But for now, it only takes 15, 20 minutes of my day. Yeah. Um, max. So, so yeah, just paid traffic for me is a big one. And then from that, you build an audience and you can then use more organic strategies. And that applies both to e commerce and obviously info products. Yeah. Both facets. And obviously, that's one lesson you learned in this process. What's been another biggest lesson you've learned throughout the process of, well, both entrepreneurship in general, in terms of every failure you've had, every success you've had, but yeah. just in, in general, your life as well, in terms of, optimizing your life for success and happiness for yourself and um, fulfillment model what others are doing find people that are very successful in your space mm. and model what they're doing don't copy what they're doing oh, that's interesting yeah but look at what they're doing why they're doing it yeah. and you know if you're in the e-com space so for me with when i started those clothing brands never ran paid traffic never even occurred to me to run paid traffic yeah had i looked at these other clothing brands and saw they were running paid traffic i could have been like oh like, maybe we'll try ads Never tried ads. And just could have picked up. Yeah, could have picked up. Yes. Um, yeah. Things like that. So yeah, just modeling what what other people are doing. And is that just in a business respect, or is that in terms of every nuance of life? Um, every nuance of life. I one of my favorite quotes is, "When, when no one stumbles into success, oh, no, it's, I totally it's agree. not an if someone's continuously successful, mm. it's not an accident. No, it, they're doing it. They're doing certain things that's allowing them to be successful. And when you start to meet and surround yourself with more successful people, you see the common traits among them and so yeah you just have to look at what successful people are doing you look at someone in the gym that's got a ripped body yeah you want to learn model what person. they're doing you yeah. want to learn from that person if you're in um another industry if you're in sales mm. you know you want to look at who's the top salesman in your company mm. how are they doing the sales calls how are they handling their job you know what are they doing model them mm. um find the most successful people in your industry and, and model what they're doing because there is a reason they're successful and it's not by accident but also whilst using your own intellect to dissect that and what i mean by yeah. that for example is like you said earlier not just necessarily believing what people are saying and yeah. similar to for example what you said there in terms of looking at the ripped person in the gym make yeah. sure they're not on steroids before you ask them what they're doing yeah it's the same respect with any obviously that applies to business in terms of yeah and and think for yourself and yeah you really do have to think for yourself and not just copy again not copy what someone's doing and expect to get the same results it's and believe what they're presenting online in terms of yeah a fictitious life or you know personal life and business life in terms of numbers as well yeah and don't believe everything you see and just yeah. look at some people and not everyone's perfect but look at one person and think, okay i like how they do that mm. i'm gonna take try that. And model that i like but i don't like how they do that yeah but i like how this person does this totally i'm gonna model that in a whole different sphere of, of worlds as well yeah whether it be lifestyle business econ mm -hmm. business whatever it may be take and learn from them i think it's very yeah. interesting like Donald Trump is a great example of this. Yeah. A lot of people think Donald Trump's stupid, he's, he's a bad person, whatever, but you could actually, a lot of people could look him fancy, but he does that really well. They can learn so much from him. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't agree with his politics in terms of how he's actually got to power in the first place. Yeah. It's something his that ability everyone, to influence you have people. to learn from that. Yeah. Absolutely. So like we've read, read Win Bigly. Yeah. Probably my favorite book this year. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting in terms of learning the nuances of his political campaign, how he chose the time to run, mm -hmm. who he was running against, every element of it, how polarizing he was. Yeah. And how he appealed to certain individuals without really stating much of his political belief. Yeah. And which, again, which is baffling but also very interesting yeah so same goes for for anyone you, there's you yeah can look at someone and before you form an opinion think i don't like that person i don't just think well, what do they do that you could model and you do like yeah and then just you know take that and run with it and obviously finally donald trump's gonna be remembered as the president that wore, wore fake tan had bad hair yeah. red tie make america great again mm -hmm. what do you want to be remembered for um it's not something i actually think about too much in terms yeah. of what i want to re remembered for but certainly someone that just made an impact whether that's in terms of you know changed skylines with the developments that we do in the development company whether it's on a philanthropic level and you know building communities mm. elsewhere or even just in a more intimate setting with family and friends mm. impacted people in a positive light even just with creating content and info products that can just literally change the trajectories of people like people's yeah. life as long as I know that I've just made an impact to other people's life, but at the same time, I've played at the highest level I can play at. Yeah, so I'm that's happy. interesting because there's an overarching theme there, mm -hmm. impact and changing yeah. people's lives, but the moving target 
is pro as, as a moving target. Yeah. In terms of which variable you do that through or how you choose to enable that. It just, yeah, an impact in every area of life. And does that also apply in terms of your objective, financially speaking? So for example, we have the conversation a lot, you and I, and obviously yeah. Fred and Matt as well, we sit down, we've been for multiple dinners, and we were like, do you want to be worth a billion? Do you want to exceed that, that accumulation of wealth? Do you want to have that number behind you? What's your thought there? Um, for me, it's not a primary objective to say I want to be worth a billion. Yeah. Do I want to build something big enough where that becomes a byproduct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Especially in the real estate game, you look at some of the top real estate developers mm. because it's a business model that is so scalable. Yeah. It's, you know, it's earth. It's the best. I, I, I always say the best business model on earth is earth. Is that, yeah, it's, no, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's real estate. And so there's so much land and to get to that level of the billion in real estate mm. is not that it's going to be easy. No, I'm not going to sit here and say confidently that, oh yeah, I could do it, but it's very much a case of, but you know, you can do it. I know it's possible. Yeah. And if I know it's possible, yeah, the, the I want to do it. Yeah. And is there a number that you'd exit for and then leave? Um, or is it going to be a case of you're always going to chase continual growth and I always want development? To be, yeah. I always want to be growing, always want to be building something bigger. Yeah. Not in a chase for happiness, not be like, I'll be happy when I achieve X. Yeah. I think it's very- You're going to have the cigar on the beach moment. No. Yeah. And I think it's very unhealthy to attach happiness to those goals. I agree. For me, it's just a game. Yeah. It's just a game. And I just want to see how far I can play the game. And I think the majority of individuals that we're aware of and that I'll speak to on this podcast also would be fairly depressed if they were to have that cigar on the beach moment. Yeah. First day, fine. A couple of days after, your kids start nagging you, your wife starts nagging you. And then by that point, you're like, what am I working for? Yeah. What am I doing? I've exited yeah. for a billion, but what am I doing? And there's obviously that's fundamental to their success. And it could be, actually, would you describe it as being an illness? Your motivation yeah. to succeed? Would I, you describe? Because I, I think you, I think you have it. Obviously, it's yeah. something which is prevalent in you. But is that something which is you describe as an illness, a sickness, or is it? Oh yeah, I was thinking this earlier on the run. Yeah. The, especially those first few kilometers where my mind is literally telling me, Tyler, you don't want to do this. Yeah, don't do you this. You haven't yeah. fueled up properly about to run 15k you've not drank any water you've got no water you've got no money for food along yeah. the way and but i'm like but i love this yeah and i'm obviously a little bit sick in the head yeah because i love it but is but, it but in a, in a healthy manner though a very it's, healthy manner it's what's been portrayed as being sick by most people who'd fail to do those things yeah but for us it's like we, we thrive in that and we enjoy it yeah we smile through it we enjoy every element of it and if we weren't doing oh, that it. we'd be like fairly depressed i think it's fair to oh, say oh i love Doing hard shit, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what you've done, Kilimanjaro, whilst uh, you've done in terms of physical feats as well, which a triathlon. Yeah, the Ironman try, Mount Fuji. Scaled your businesses to what about two hundred k per month of revenue now around 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 that bracket. Yeah. Um, what uh, actually interestingly, what's been more difficult, the physical feats or scaling a business? They're, they're two completely different things, but I would say scaling a business. It's a psychological warfare, isn't it? Pretty much. Um, yeah. With yourself. The, the physical feats, it's because the reason I do those is just I have this drive to just want to see what my human potential is, not yeah. just in business, but also my physical capabilities. Yeah, no, massively. Which is why when I do the Ironman or if I want to do the, one of my goals is to do the Sahara Desert Ultra Marathon. Yeah. It's, but but I, I tell people the Ironman, like, was it super hard? I'm like, actually, you know, the hard parts of training, you just do the six months of training. Yeah. You just, do and it's the same in business you just do those little things every day you just do the one hour swim in the morning yeah a couple hours on the bike in the evening or a run or whatever the training and eventually you're there it all falls into place yeah and and it feels bliss it's yeah flow and when i when i first did when i first started training for the ironman i got in the pool the first time i tried to swim in years i did mm. one length of the pool yeah and i was shot i yeah. was like my breathing heavy i was like okay, what, how, what am I going to do in like eight, nine months time? Yeah. Yeah. But then you were just shocked at how just doing the same stuff every day, long term, your body adapts, yeah. you grow as a person. And before you know it on the day, you just, you're in that flow state and it happens and it's the same in business. You yeah. just do those small things every day. It's so interesting though, because most successful people mm -hmm. have an, an element of, they really prioritize their physical health and exploring how they can push their bodies to new limits. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. You look at like, I guess, well, Kobe Bryant, but I know, He's an athlete anyway, but mm. he invests like what a million. He was investing like a million dollars a year into his health. Yeah, and you look at Tony Robbins. Oh mate, like the age the he's at now, reinvesting himself is insane. And to perform at the level of intensity that he plays at, on yeah. like a three or four day live event mm. at his age, is just beyond any comprehension. I mean, even someone like Branson, 
Yeah. On more of a lower level in terms of it's not so biohacking as such, but it's a case of he goes to gym every day, trains yeah. every day, plays tennis every day, takes care of those those variables and has ex- explored elements of, well, I think Kilimanjaro at certain points or yeah. crazy other physical feats. Which oh, then, crazy stuff, yeah. It's interesting your thought that I, I do, I would agree that scaling a business is more difficult than yeah. completing those physical feats. For sure. But entrepreneurs, I'm not sure you agree, are athletes and they have the same mindset as athletes. Yeah, I think you have to. You have to. You have to think like an athlete and train like an athlete. But I think an, ex- an extension of that is knowledge. Yeah. Because you have to have that athletic discipline and pursuit of goals, but then you also have to apply the element of actually have to think about things rather mm-hmm. than just doing it. Whereas with sure. training, yes, you have a plan in front of you. Mm-hmm. For example, 15K, we knew today, okay, we've got, we've got to do 15K. Mm-hmm. Don't have to think about anything whilst doing it. Yeah. Whereas whilst you're business, building a business, it's like, I better swerve that. I've got, yeah. to, I've got to move here. I've got to bring these people on board. It's a different ball game in itself. It's, yeah, you've got you to know. handle the stress of managing a team. and Yeah, finances, yeah. everything. Mm-hmm. Whether or not you're making the right decision, which could lose you 5 million or, you know, build a billion mm-hmm. pound business. Is, but if you're trying to do that and not looking after your health and your body, and you're not at a peak state. You're your totally body. compromised. Yeah. You may last, what, five years. Mm-hmm. But oh, that kind of leads me to this one as well. That's interesting though, because one of the, your friends, one of your close friends also is in mm-hmm. the space of info products. Yeah. Doesn't take care of his health at all. No. Yet has had success, has attained success. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that's simply because of his level of intellect and knowledge and insight? Or is that a case of he could have attained a lot more success and got a lot further at this point already had he prioritized his health? Could have gone, 100% could have gone a lot further. Yeah. Definitely could have gone a lot further. But again, in terms of just his business acumen, yeah, he just follows a few sort of guiding principles. He thinks big, mm. does just get two or three important things done a day. Big decisions. Builds the right teams around him. Yeah. Um, but... Could he improve his output? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. 100%. So, so now, yeah, do you think he's going to shoot himself in the foot with that eventually? Or has done already? Um, I think has done already and, yeah, will not be able to live as long a life as if he looked after his health. Yeah. And also in later years not be able to perform at the same level. I think it's also the level of clarity you have with your thoughts. Mm-hmm. It's a massive variable which people tend to neglect when they think about their health and how it contributes to success. Well, one thing I say to people is you go down to your local pub on the weekend, maybe like a Weatherspoons, mm. and look at like some of the six-year-olds that are there that have been going to that same pub for the Spoons. last yeah, quality. 20, yeah, 30 yeah. years, have a few pints each night. Yeah, They've lost all their hair. They're in bad shape. They're probably limping because they've got like joint problems or back problems. Yeah. And they're just in bad state. Complaining about the healthcare system, level mm-hmm. of conversations. Right exactly. Before. Yeah. You then go to the gym and look at maybe someone in the gym that's maybe like sim- same age, mm. but has been consistently going to the gym for the last couple of decades mm. and is in great shape and is completely mobile and moving around. Yeah. If you, if those two are entrepreneurs, who's the entrepreneur that can be able to make the most money, perform at the highest level in business? Yeah, of course. The one that's looked after their health. I mean, not obviously your dad's not that age, but look at your dad. Yeah. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. But I mean, ripped. to be brutally honest, there's a comparison between your dad and my dad also. Obviously mm-hmm. my dad died this year from cancer, mm-hmm. didn't take care of his health whatsoever. Mm-hmm. This isn't a shot or anything. This isn't, I mean, it's being brutally honest. Sure. Didn't prioritize his sleep, any variable like that. And then on the flip side, yep. your dad's achieved great success in business. Mm-hmm. He's taking care of his body to the ultimate T. Your dad's ripped. Yeah. He's competing all these ridiculous challenges and he's probably one of the most energized people that I'm aware of on social media at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to keep up with. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. But one, so an interesting, you mentioned my dad, he's a couple of the business partners he started in business with when he was in our age in his early 20s yeah this year and the last year have died at the same age of cancers and yeah just because when they were that age they were drinking they were doing drugs they weren't looking after the health they weren't going to the gym yeah and now it's caught up with them and ask any of them on their deathbed would they have changed it they would have changed it in a heartbeat if they could have would you change the way you've lived your life on your on your deathbed to this point no at this point, no. Um, I think if you were con- to continue down this route in terms of prioritizing, I always know you, I can do more. In terms of prioritizing your ambitions over other variables of life, would you change that decision if you were to do that for the next, let's say, seventy years? Um, I think I've found a balance, and I don't like the word balance too much. Mm. That works for me. Yeah, like a harmony. A harmony. A harmony of variables. Yeah. Yeah. So you, there'd be no element of reflection where you're like, I should have spent more time with family, friends. No, I, 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 again, one of the non-negotiables for me is I go up and I see my family at least once a week yeah. or I speak to them every day and I do have a lot of healthy relationships and yeah. don't disregard that at all. No, absolutely. But I'm also very conscious that if I was to get into a relationship or have kids in mm. the next five years, I will probably not be the best father to those kids yeah. that I want to be if I am true to my vision. Yeah. I would at that point have to make a decision. Do I dedicate my time and energy to being a great father? Yeah or achieving my vision, which is why I'm willing to, you know, put that sort of thing 
maybe it's a sacrifice if you want to call it or something that's maybe not a priority for me right now for the next five to 10, 15 years. But eventually it will be. For sure. Yeah. And by that point you would have wanted to achieve your initial goals at least. Um, be at a point where I know maybe I've removed myself from a lot of the business and it's growing at a rate that I'm happy with that mm. I can still, you know, I've found got a base and i'm very settled yeah not that i'll ever settle settle but no well no can it's raise a family wide. you're never gonna yeah. settle settle mm -hmm. but it's an element where you can remove yourself from the day-to-day -day so much therefore yeah. focus on the family more mm -hmm. like, that's very interesting and i think that's the best age to do it personally as well for sure i was thinking this case if you have kids too young it's it's almost selfish in respect where you're not actually fulfilling your own dreams in that respect yeah, as and, well. I, I and therefore you're gonna have a less you mean less well beneficial to your children as parents yeah you're gonna teach them so much i think I'm sure you're the same. You, if I mean, I'm going to have kids. I just want to be the best possible role model that I could possibly be. Yeah, same. Not time 30, 35 though. Yeah. Yeah. And so at that yeah, point, I, don't I want to do my own thing. Exactly. Yeah. No matter if it's, I mean, I'm sure I have the same partner now, honestly, but mm -hmm. I think it'll be the same thing. I'll have kids when I'm 30, 35. Sure. And therefore can actually be a good father at that point as well. Yeah. That's interesting. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Mate, I've loved dude, it. Dude, awesome first podcast. Loved Thanks it. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure, dude.